Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 41 of UAB Green and Told, original air date Monday, March 15th, 2021. Through this podcast, we are able to share stories from members of the UAB community. I'm Greg Barry, a UAB alum and assistant director in the Office of Alumni Affairs. You can listen to all our episodes of UAB Green and Told on Spotify and the Apple Podcast app. While there, I'd love for you to leave a written review so we can reach more alumni. Today, we're all abuzz as we sit down with Adam Hickman. As Adam will share, before becoming a beekeeper, he was entrenched in the culinary world, but not as a chef, saucier, or even a baker. No, he developed recipes in a test kitchen here in Birmingham that were featured in food magazines everywhere. Literally, for those recipes, when you look at them in the magazine and you wonder where they came from, they came from somebody like me. But as Adam will explain, his career would shift away from writing those recipes and would land on, of all things, bees. I had a little bit of time and a little bit of money and I just decided to, to try it. So I just got into bees and thought it was cool. And while bees are most famously known for honey, that's not why people stick with them. But there's a lot more interesting things in bees that are, that are appealing to nearly, nearly everybody. Adam Hickman knows his way around a kitchen. As a high school kid in Florida, he found his way into culinary classes, but they were far from the home ec courses you probably remember. But for a kid who fell in love with food at an early age, they were a perfect fit. I, I guess cooking was just something that was just very natural to me. Like I was very comfortable with it. It wasn't that difficult. I kind of understood the concepts, um, I guess, beyond the average person. Um, and I was actually fortunate enough to go to a high school that had a culinary program in it. Okay. So I spent uh, sophomore through senior year actually taking a culinary classes for a couple hours a day and and really, really enjoyed it. And it wasn't um, it wasn't a home ec class. Okay. So a, a lot of a lot of people will think of uh, cooking in high school as uh, fundraisers and brownies and cupcakes. Yeah. Um, so this was actually a legitimate uh, industry grade culinary kitchen. Everything is stainless steel, you scrub the floors, all that kind of stuff. Uh, actually, I had a great instructor that I still keep in contact with today um, that was uh, very influential for me. You had a great experience in high school then with cooking and the whole culinary aspect of things. Did you know that that's kind of what you wanted to do after high school at that time? Yes, I kind of gravitated towards it. So um, I always felt that you should pursue what you're kind of naturally good at. Uh, and uh, I, while that isn't always the case, that is how I felt in, in high school. Um, so I was just like, I like cooking. Um, it seems to be that I'm good at it. I, I understand it. I think there's a future in it. Um, so that's when I uh, finished high school and then went to Johnson and Wales in Miami, which is which is actually a, an incredibly good culinary program. It's one of the, the best ones in the country. Uh, paid a lot of money for the education, um, loved every minute of it, um, and it was a great platform for the rest of my culinary career. And you went to Johnson and Wales. You had plans of doing what? Well, it, I guess the better answer is I know what I didn't want to do. Okay. Um, so I had a I had a great high school instructor that really spoke some wisdom and said, if you're going to go go to culinary school and you're going to choose this industry, uh, you need to do something besides get a food degree. Uh, because those degrees are, are becoming a little bit of a dime a dozen. And even when you work in the industry, you necessarily don't need one of those. So it helps, but you don't need one. So just don't get that one. You need to do something else. You need to be a little bit more well-rounded. And and I knew that I was going to be doing something besides culinary academically. Um, so for me, that plan was to go to um, Florida International University in Miami or um, South Florida and get a a hospitality uh, management degree. That was the original plan was culinary and then hospitality. Um, but those plans kind of changed um, when I didn't love Miami. You know, I just kind of, it wasn't itching to get out of it, but I knew that wasn't where I, I, I knew there was more out there for me. So uh, I went to uh, Johnson Wales for a couple of years, finished that program. I got an associates, um, did a, a little traveling, went to Europe for a semester and went to school there and then came back. And then I was just like, okay, what's next? I don't, I don't want to get a, a hospitality degree per se. I don't want to live back home with my parents. What do I do next? Um, and that's where kind of UAB stepped in and I kind of started pursuing that. And I, I knew some people from Birmingham. 
uh, I had a friend who was a, a UAB student and he, he loved UAB. So I said, why don't I just check it out? Let me just go up there and see. I knew that UAB had a business school um, and it just kind of worked out. It was like, it just made sense for me to, to, to move everything. And I remember that day when uh, I was actually, I had breakfast with my dad, we're at the beach and I just kind of told him uh, that I want to move to Birmingham. I have no family here. Uh, didn't have any connections. I was just like, I'm just going to go to UAB and go to school. It's kind of crazy when you th sit back and reflect on things like that, thinking, you know, I, I'm a Florida kid and I'm going to be in Florida my entire life or a good chunk of it. Then all of a sudden you're in Birmingham for, for 15 years. Yeah, exactly. I've got roots here. I've got friends and, and family married and raising kids here. And it's, it's home. I mean, we don't have any plans to, to leave Birmingham. Um, we just, we really just love it. When you came to Birmingham and you started in the class school of business, were you hoping to kind of embark on a career in the restaurant business or what was, what was kind of where you were going? So with there's that? this, uh, there's this part of the food industry called contract dining. Uh, and the best way to describe that is, uh, Sodexo, Aramark, Compass, everybody knows those companies. Everybody's been to college knows that, uh, that their cafeteria is run by one of those companies typically. Um, and uh, my plan was to uh, get a business degree, round out my education, get some more experience, make some contacts, and then start working in the contract dining world. And who knows where that would take me, but I liked food and I also liked business and, and management. So that's where I actually thought I was gonna be going. And, and that's when, I mean, I wasn't even in Birmingham two weeks when I stopped at the, uh, the commons um, on campus. And I started talking to, uh, you could always tell who the management are and who aren't. And I just, I just introduced myself to them and said, this is who I am. This is my background. This is what I want to do. Can I work with you guys? Um, so uh, they, they brought me on and I, and, and I spent uh, basically any moment I wasn't in a class while I was on campus, I was working. I was, I was doing catering. I was setting up uh, for conferences, I was setting up for banquets in uh, that little, uh, it's probably demolished now because they replaced the HUC, but there was this tiny little banquet room um, that was right across the HUC and I'm sure it's gone now, but um, I spent a lot of hours just uh, setting the silverware and the napkins just right. Uh, and that's how I basically paid my way through college is, is doing that type of work at UAB. What was it about contract dining that drew you in? It, it, again, it was the it was what I didn't want to do. So I knew that restaurant life was hard. Uh, I knew enough people who were working in restaurants and and know that that's that's not the that's not the lifestyle that I wanted. Um, I didn't want to work when everybody else uh, wasn't working, basically. So contract dining, um, kind of depending on the the organization you work for, puts you in an environment where you might be you might be working. Uh, a normal schedule Monday to Friday and not be working nights and weekends. And there's always exceptions, but I knew that if, if I was going to build a, a degree or a, a build a career in this industry, that's something that I would need to do is, is get into contract dining. But so that's what I did when I was an undergrad, but um, lo and behold, that's not exactly what I ended up doing. After you graduate, you spent 10 years kind of just milling about developing recipes and doing a lot of cooking. What was that experience like? Because you worked at, with a lot of different magazines with Food and Wine, Cooking Light, Southern Living, and, and a myriad of others. I That wasn't the contract dining uh, industry that I thought I was gonna go to. I had no idea that Birmingham had such a uh, influential food industry when I when I moved here, we really do. And even even since I moved here, it's it's really really increased a lot. But one of those is that just off of Lakeshore, we have this huge um, uh, department, this 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 company that develops, tests, uh, photographs, um, food styles, recipes for the nation's largest food brands. And most people don't know that's here. Um, and I didn't. I didn't even know it was here until after I graduated when I. I learned there was an internship position in the cooking light test kitchen. Uh, it was for six months. And I said, well, let me, let me just try this and see what happens. Uh, I had already finished uh, UAB. I, I didn't think the contract dining thing was going to work out. And I, and I was always a very analytical person. So cooking and then developing, and it's basically research and development for, for recipes. So I, I kind of started doing that and I really loved it. I turned out I was pretty good at it. So about three months into the six month internship, I got a full time job and spent the next few years uh, developing recipes for Cooking Light. And then we we expanded and started doing recipes for uh, Southern Living, Real Simple, 
health magazine, um, food and wine. And I mean, I stopped, I kind of stopped keeping track of all the different brands that we did, but I was there 10 years. I, I can't remember the, how many thousands of recipes that I had worked on over the years, but literally for those recipes, when you look at them in the magazine and you wonder where they came from, they came from somebody like me who, uh, came up with the idea and, and, and changed it so that it works for if it needs to be a summer recipe or a winter feed four people cost $10 to, to feed people, you know, that type of, you, you have to get to develop so that the, the end user, their needs are met. You worked in that world for pretty much a solid decade. What made you leave that? Because you were having so much fun. You enjoyed it a lot. It was it was incredibly interesting work. It was a it was an industry I had no idea existed. I didn't know what type of people did it, um, and I really did enjoy it. Um, the The truth is, after a while, it became less challenging. You know, you, and I didn't realize this going in, but you're if if after the first like four years or so, you start to realize that summer happens every year, and then summer recipes happen every year and tomatoes happen every year and corn and grilling recipes and and the same thing for fall and the winter and and when you start when you start cooking pretty much the same recipes or the same type of stuff seasonally year after year after year you get a little bit uh, a little bit restless um so uh fortunately about year six or seven i started i started working on different brands and starting doing more videos and blog content and that type of stuff so it, it made it a little bit more interesting but still, that gap was there between between the work I was doing and seeing the the final feedback from the end user. Like I just I just missed that like that that customer experience. Um, yeah, I just I just didn't get um, in that environment. And during that entire process, you actually started a side hustle, and you kind of gravitated towards bees. Where did the interest in bees and beekeeping come from? I got into bees because it was interesting to me and I had a, uh, no pun in, no pun intended, I had a bug in my ear from when I was in middle school and I, I saw my great grandfather's beekeeping supplies when I was a kid and it was his extractor, it was his smoker, which I, which I have both of those t t um, still today and I thought they were my, interesting. My dad explained what they were, who, he wasn't a beekeeper, he just had them. He, he explained what they were to me. And as a middle school kid, I just thought that's kind of cool. Um, so about, uh, I guess it was about 2011 or so, I I had a little bit of time and a little bit of money and, and I decided to to try it. So I just got into bees and thought it was cool. I mean, I, I just thought it, I didn't wasn't getting into it for the honey per se, for the, the food angle. I just thought it was interesting. I wanted to try it. And a couple years later, I, I just said, let me see if I can make some money doing this. And I've, I figured out what the pain points were for, for myself because I was the customer that I was going to be selling to. And uh, getting supplies and getting equipment and getting good education was really difficult to get. And so 2014, while I was still doing all that food work, I was, I guess, about four or five years into it, I just started this little side hustle. And, and I don't know if side hustles is a mark of the millennial, but it seems like a lot of us have them. Um, a lot of us do something else, whether it's driving for Uber or writing a blog or keeping bees. Um, we all have something. And, and I honestly had no intentions of it turning into a career. I just thought it was fun to, to keep bees and to make a little money selling this and that. Uh, so I did that um, starting in 2014. I mean, I actually I made it official, like I got the LLC and everything, but um, I just decided to kind of pursue that. And honestly, the ball rolled itself. Uh, I didn't really, I put some effort into it. And, but when the word got out of the, the kind of stuff that I was selling and uh, the kind of education I was giving, um, it just kind of kept going and kept going and kept going and it became more and more successful to the point where uh, I barely survived last year. I barely survived 2020 or 2019. And uh, I had to, had to make a choice. Do I do this career or this career? And I chose, I chose beekeeping. Beekeeping as a hobby is cumbersome. I mean, it takes a lot of work. What all goes into keeping bees and raising them so they can provide honey? It's difficult. Um, you know, when I when I teach these classes and I and I talk to beginners or people thinking about it, I, I don't I don't try to sugarcoat stuff. Uh, I don't try to make the sale per se. Um, I just I answer questions and I tell them what it's really going to be like. Um, it's uh, beekeeping is 
um, it's you're taking care of a farm animal. I mean, it's not it's it's just like a it's just like taking care of cattle or pigs or chickens. Like there's there's things that you have to do to to make sure they are successful. And you can do absolutely everything right and still be unsuccessful, which is which is one of the hardest parts of, of getting started. But with telling people the truth about getting started, I also tell them that year one and two are hard and year three and four are fun. I mean, it's always fun. I mean, there's always if your goal is to only get honey from it, um, you're kind of setting yourself up to possibly get discouraged. Um, and, but there's a lot more interesting things in bees that are, that are appealing to nearly nearly everybody. There's there's astronomy. Uh, there's understanding the the climate and weather. There is uh, the 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 work ethic and the sweat equity of working around bees. If you love being alone, it's a great hobby. You know, people aren't bothering you when you're opening up your hives and you got a bunch of stinging insects. Uh, if you like woodworking, there's a lot of woodworking in it. Um, there's obviously the honey side of of getting something that you have seen made completely in your backyard from scratch and it, the bees made it themselves. So there's a lot of appealing things to, about beekeeping that, um, that I fell in love with, um, but I get to share that with other people as well. Do you still have your own bees? I do, yeah. I'm actually, I'm not just a, uh, a businessman that sells something. I'm actually, I am my customer. I'm a certified master beekeeper. Um, I keep around 20 hives or so all around, all around uh, Birmingham. Uh, one of those things that I do is I connect or I, I help companies or individuals or schools that have space and they want to keep bees, but they don't want to hire, they don't want to teach somebody to do it or do it themselves. They'll actually bring me on site and I'll, I will put my bees on site and manage them for them. Uh, and they get the benefits of having bees in their environment. So that's actually, um, I got connected with UAB again um, last year because we were going to set up some hives right around March of 2020. Um, but that changed um, when when with the, when everything hit the fan. So we had to postpone that a little bit. What are the talks like for getting the bees on campus? Because I know it was happening, you know, right around the turn of this past year, yeah. but where are we at now? And are we going to see it in 2021? That's the plan is to, um, is to help enhance that community garden and place uh, two hives there. And those bees will actually cover uh, the entire UAB campus. So a lot of people will think that, you know, in order to have bees, I need to have a garden or I need to plant something for the bees. That That's somewhat beneficial, but bees will fly up to five miles uh, in search of water or, or nectar or pollen. So they'll they'll help enhance the, that community garden as well as the entire UAB campus. With two hives, how many bees are we talking? Obviously it's approximation. Around 10,000 bees are in a hive during the winter. And that same hive will have about 60,000 bees during the summer. So one of those things I didn't, I didn't understand when I was getting into bees is that you don't just have a box full of honeybees making honey. You have a, a range in responsibilities and jobs that change throughout the bee's life. So uh, if, a, if a bee lives 60 days, they might go through a dozen different jobs in that 60 day period. So there, there's a, there's a good distribution of responsibilities among among the bees and to put it simply as they get older they get more responsibility so if they live 60 days that first 30 days they're probably spending most of their time inside the hive taking care of the responsibilities in the inside the hive and as they get more experience they kind of get promotions and then they get to do more um, uh, intense difficult things and that might be being a guard bee and that might be that might turn into um, going and foraging for water and pollen and then that might turn into foraging for nectar so um, they have these jobs that change throughout the throughout their lifespan which is only 60 days and and beyond that the population of the colony is increasing in the spring when they when they need a lot of workers and it's decreasing in the summer or i'm sorry decreasing in the winter when they they don't have a, a lot of needs you know you wonder why why don't i ever see bees in the winter like you just don't because nothing is blooming. They don't, they don't want to have a, a 60,000 um, strong colony just eating. So they kind of reduce their population down to about 10,000 because they're just trying to survive the winter. There's nothing else to do except for survive and wait until next spring. So there's, those are the interesting things about beekeeping that I, I, never, I never knew before I got into it. Were you surprised how big of a bee community there is in Birmingham and the surrounding areas? It's impressive. Uh, 
there we i'm a member of the jefferson county beekeepers association and uh, pre-pandemic we would easily have over 100 people coming to those meetings at the botanical gardens uh, and that was just beekeepers who came to those meetings that's not all the beekeepers obviously i was able to to talk to people about bees from a lot of different backgrounds uh, usually especially in our climate you have you have people who are in their camps. They talk to people just like them. Um, they spend time with people just like them. Uh, and they they kind of have their their positions and they like the people around them to support their positions. But when you go to a beekeeping meeting, you have you have Republicans, you have liberals, you have independents, you have conservative, you have all these different types of people. You have people driving giant F-350s and then you have Priuses too. You have people who want to make money taking care of bees and you have people who just love bees and they want to learn more and you have all these different types of people coming together for one common interest bees obviously help make the world around us more beautiful just with the pollination of flowers what were some of the benefits of bees to the community generally the public thinks of a honeybee as the as bees entirely a honeybee is one of 20,000 types of bees in North America or in the world. Okay. So, yeah. So you would think that it's a, a bee is a bee is a bee, but that's not the, not the truth. Um, we, we have bees that specialize in uh, pollinating tomatoes and cucumbers and squash. And you have solitary bees that don't live in hives like a honeybee does. And they, they are a certain shape that allows them to get into uh, a certain flower and pollinate it. So, there's certain types of clover that bees can't pollinate. They can't get their tongues into it. The, the neck of the flower is too long and the, the tongue of the bee can't actually get down into the flower. But we have all these bees and they do have their specialties. Um, and you can't put it all on the honeybee um, and you can't put it all on another one. They all work together um, with, their own, with their own abilities and, and, and specialties. What's the biggest challenge in raising bees? Keeping them alive. If you start beekeeping with one hive, that one hive can go to zero over the winter pretty easily. There's a lot of there's a lot of threats to bees, both things that beekeepers can help and they can't help too. There's there's little bugs that live on bees and actually feed on bees, um, like a like a tick basically uh, that lives on the bee. Uh, and there's other small insects that get in there and disrupt the colony. And you're fighting all of these, and you, and then you're also fighting a lack of forage for the bees. Um, so there's there's all these things that make beekeeping more difficult for the beekeeper. And that first year is a little tough. That second year uh, is not as hard. But by the time you roll around your third year, the bees have momentum. You have momentum. I mean, the bees still ha they have to survive their beekeeper. You know, not uh, honestly, not all beekeepers are, are great for their bees. Um, so it's um, it's it can be difficult. But um, but just like many difficult things, uh, they become very rewarding if you stick with it. Even though you don't raise your bees for the honey, considering your culinary background, what's your favorite dish to make with honey? I like to think of honey as a finisher, um, not so much uh, something that I like a substitute for sugar. Um, it's a great substitute for sugar, uh, but uh, I think it's a it's a great way to uh, change from maple syrup or corn syrup, or whatever you know, whatever product you use, and use honey instead um, because. You're not heating it on your waffles or pancakes. It's delicious. It's not just sweet. It tastes like tastes like flowers. If you ever get a like a a very uh, generic bottle of honey and you compare it against one you bought from a beekeeper, one is they're both sweet and one tastes like flowers. It's if you it's just a, an amazing thing. And I love doing side by side honey tests with people or honey tastings with people because if you're if you're tasting honey one at a time and you're not tasting it against something else, it's hard to tell the difference, especially for the, the average person. But if you get two bottles right next to each other, it's like night and day. I, like it's whenever I do these classes and honey tastings, it's it's just so fun. That part of it is just fun because people, they grow up with the honey bear, right? I mean, everybody knows what the honey bear is in their mind. Um, but when you taste that right next to something you bought from a beekeeper, completely different. A little bit earlier, you alluded to the fact that the Birmingham food scene is actually kind of underrated from a culinary perspective, how strong is the Birmingham food scene? Probably top 10. We consistently 
are awarding our chefs and our restaurants uh, with James Beard Awards. Uh, and the, the James Beard is the, the food person's award. So it's not, it's not the Food Network Award. It's not, uh, you know, click my website the most and vote for, vote for your local restaurant. It's foodies giving awards to restaurants and to chefs. So if, if you want to know what the best restaurants are in a city, you go to James Beard and you look at who, who has been given awards. And uh, I've got personal friends who have won multiple awards for different things. And uh, I'm, I couldn't be proud of, prouder of them for the work that they did. Um, and then behind every single one of those is a half a dozen chefs supporting them as well uh, and learning the same thing. So we have a lot of chefs who don't get uh, James Beard awards, but work under those those chefs and go out and they start their own restaurants uh, and they start their own food ventures. So uh, we're definitely we're definitely top 10 in the nation. That's Adam Hickman. In 2010, Adam earned a bachelor's degree in management from the UAB Collapse School of Business. Adam founded Foxhound Bee Company in 2014 as a side hustle. And yes, this full-time beekeeper knows what it means to be a blazer. I think that when you when you look at UAB in the in the scope of Auburn and and Alabama and these other schools, you you see that UAB is different than from those other ones. It seems like a lot of students who who go to UAB don't necessarily go to UAB with a chip on their shoulder, but it's kind of like when you compare yourself to these other schools, it's like you're proud to go to UAB because you did something different than everybody else. And I don't know if that's that's the right way to, to look at it, but when I talk to when I talk to every other UAB student, I think that we have something in common because we we did what we really want, wanted to do. And we went to a, a school that uh, is in the middle of downtown in traffic and is not your is not your typical undergraduate experience um and it's it's i'm proud to like share that with other students and to know that like we went to a school that doesn't always have the same reputation as these huge enormous schools with giant football programs um, but we got like an excellent education and we got to work with other students who were like-minded and had the same goals and uh and work and or not work but just go to school in, in that type of environment Stay on top of all of our episodes by listening in at alumni.uab.edu slash greenandtold. Have a story to share? Email me at greenandtold at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for at UAB alumni. Thanks for listening. And until next time, go Blazers.